I recently published a YouTube video all about the song Killing Me Softly. I start with the Fuji's version, talk about Lauryn Hill's vocal, the sample of the Tribe song, where that sample came from, etc., and how this is all a cover of the Roberta Flack song, right? I break down Roberta's version, the groove on it, some of the musical elements there, and then I talk about the original artist who isn't Roberta Flack. I'm talking about Lori Lieberman, the original artist who's gone uncredited for years, and the other songwriters have since actively tried to change the story. So then I take Lori's original vocal, mix it with the Roberta Flack version, mix it with the Fuji's version, play some bass, it's a good time. It was a fun video and I got a lot of positive comments from people saying they loved hearing about the original story and the mix of all three versions of the song. But then I woke up the next morning and I had a text from Lori Lieberman. It turns out we have a mutual friend and he had sent the video to her as well as my number. Well, one thing led to another, and I'm so pleased to introduce my guest today, Lori Lieberman. She's a singer-songwriter who is, yes, the original artist behind Killing Me Softly, but also, after an extended hiatus, she restarted her career and has just released so many albums, kept going, made incredible music. She's playing at Carnegie Hall in December. It's amazing. This was such a fun conversation. We get into even more details of the Killing Me Softly story, as well as her career since and her upcoming performance. She even plays and sings at moments. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Lori Lieberman. Yeah. Lori Lieberman, thank you so much for sitting down and, and talking to me. It's such a pleasure. I am so happy that this happened. You know, I... I I think I was telling you before you pressed record that I've become such a major fan of yours. Everything that you're doing and the deep dives and the uh, uh, reimaginings and uh, the creativity, it's really amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun um, with it and uh, enjoying digging through stuff and getting to do like like I did for the Killing Me Softly video. Um, right. I'm trying to you know, dig as far back into the history as possible. And that, uh, for this, for that song in particular, that, that led to you. And then I'm so glad that we're able to connect, um, and, and yeah. talk directly. So yeah. I know. me too, me too. Let's start around there around, um, okay. killing me softly and around, um, wow. your early career. Cause you, you kind of have a couple waves of, of yeah. so, um, <laughs> Yeah, tell me about because I know like the the story is you were at the Troubadour, uh, and I know that's its own whole scene there, and and very right. like uh, James Taylor, um, like those similar artists. So um, yeah. tell me how how you started um, and and what that was like in your in your early days. I mean, you know, I, I um, my very early days were I was born in L.A. But my father uh, moved us to Switzerland uh, because okay. he had invented this paint that uh, he wanted to make international. His name was Ken and his company was called Kenetex. So we moved to Geneva, Switzerland. And as I grew up there, I was kind of the only person that played the guitar. And um, my influences were a lot of the French artists. Uh, and uh, And then I went to college in Boston and kind of majored in in uh, music, came out to L.A. two years later. Horrible okay. student, by the way. Couldn't wait to get out of college <laughs> and, <laughs> and came out to L.A. and quickly got signed by a management team, um, Fox Gimble. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for somebody to oh, write for, publish, produce, manage, you know, the whole package. And I was, you know, pretty young um uh, around 19 18 19 and uh you know i was so happy that somebody believed in me so i you know i signed away a whole lot of things and i was just so thrilled you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um and so my first album uh, we got signed for uh, to capitol records and my first album um it were a bunch of songs that they had crafted for me and as a personal relationship started with one of them norman gimbal i started to kind of share my personal diaries and songs were written from them so we had a rocky first year we had a rocky three years but in that first year um i went to the troubadour with my my girlfriend michelle willens who's a, a writer mm -hmm. and uh, she was a big fan of don mclean and yeah. 
uh, urged me to go, which I kind of didn't want to do. I just wanted to sit in my apartment and eat frozen M&Ms like I always <laughs> did. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so you're right. It was the age of James Taylor, Carol King, um, the Eagles, um, the Troubadour um, was a really big deal. I, I yeah. think you're from L.A., aren't you, Brandon? Yeah. Yeah, so you know, it it was it was pretty huge um and to see the great artists there was a, a you know, really big thing. So Don McLean was performing and I you know, reluctantly went. And I was sitting in the back of the club and um you know, he started to sing a bunch of his songs just him and his guitar and I mean, he was so good back then. He yeah. he was so good. In the in the seventies, you know, I mean, really uh, captivating and kind of moody, and all the girls loved him. And then he sang a song called "Empty Chairs," and I might sort of have some bronchitis, but you know. Yes. I wonder if you know that I never understood that although you said you'd go until you did. I never thought you would. I don't know if you could hear that or not, but yes, that's, that's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad you had piano. That's amazing. Oh, good. Um, but so when he said that, I just felt like the whole room disappeared, and it was just just me feeling as vulnerable as I possibly could. And I wrote um, a poem on a napkin. Um, and it was a poem about being in an audience and seeing a singer who was singing about me and my life and uh, how could he know me so well when we hadn't met and that I felt like he was reading my letters, my diaries. And, um, you know, it was pretty much, you know, that whole that whole experience. And yeah. my girlfriend Michelle, Mickey, I call her, um, you know, she read it and, and we talked about it. And later on, um, I went back to my apartment on Sunset and uh, and called Norman Gimbel, the lyricist, and I told him about this experience that I had just had. And he um, said, you know, God, that really sounds like that might go really well with a, uh, a line that I have in my in a book. He had a book of titles, uh, killing them, killing me softly with his blues. And, uh, you know, maybe, um, and he'd gotten that title from a book from an Argentinian. I think, you know, this actually, cause I saw it on your, on your piece oh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> from a novel. He was always, you know, lifting things and, you know, using them as inspiration. And by the way, he was a very talented, uh, you know, very talented lyricist, um, really had had a series of hits from, you know, I love him, I love him, and, you know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, the name on Canadian Sunset, all that stuff. Anyway, so he said that might go really well with, um, you know, this title that I have. And and so for the next day, because we were under pressure to finish this album, um, mm -hmm. the, the next day, that night, the next day is like, where were you sitting? What were you feeling? What were you thinking? And, uh, you know, we went over the lyric really specifically, um, and, uh, and then we showed it to Charles Fox, who's the musician part of yeah. the team. And he wrote that melody in a, in a minute. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he came up with it so quickly. He was really talented as well. And, um, you know, so that's, we, we discussed, oh, but this is an interesting fact. I don't yeah. know if and your audience would, and you can edit it out, but, yeah, yeah. um, when you know when we were working on that song, it was the time of Richard Harris, MacArthur Park. Oh yeah, you know someone left the cake out in the rain. That one. Yeah. <laughs> Who left the cake out in the rain? You know, but anyway, um, and so <laughs> and so, "Killing Me Softly" was bookended by another song that um, called "Back to Before" from my first album. So it was kind of like. Um, uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I'll be out of tune. Pick up your bass, Brandon. Oh. Come on, let's do this thing. <laughs> if and we like, didn't wait. have audio delay, I would be all about it. Absolutely. 
Okay. So my voice, I've got some bronchitis going, so forgive me, but so oh, yeah. it was like drumming my pain with his fingers, singing my life with his words, killing me softly with his song, killing me softly with his song, telling my whole life with his words, killing me softly with his song and then it went to and and this other song that had nothing to do with this about yeah, taking yeah. back to before and so the song killing me softly was just a really long and endless piece <laughs> and i talked them out of putting that middle section in and so yeah. it kind of just sewed together neatly um yeah. You know, that's how it happened. And then the song was released. I, you know, uh, got a little bit of airplay um, on KNXFM. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and it was starting to climb up the charts a little bit. Yeah, I think maybe out of 200, maybe it got to 198, maybe, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they have been just cash box. I don't know. And, um, and then Roberta Flack um, heard my version on an airplane and and liked it and listened to it a thousand times and made it what I couldn't have, you yeah. know. She just turned it into, you know, this worldwide hit. And for me, you know, it was just a simple, you know, pretty simple folk song. Yeah. What was that like uh, hearing her version or, or how did that go from your end? Did you know she was going to record it or, or did you just hear it first? And, and what was that like your first time kind of encountering? Yeah. Uh, well, so I had been told by uh, Gimbal and Fox that she was going to record it. And um, I felt um, I was, had been a big fan of hers with, you know, first time ever I saw your face, but I uh, also felt, oh, damn, it's just starting to climb up the charts. Give me a chance. I felt that way a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's a, oh. but okay. So she went ahead and, and did it. And the first time I heard it, I was on the freeway. And by the way, I'm freeway phobic anyway. So here I'm hearing, yeah. you know, this song and the whoa, whoa, you know, and all of that that wasn't a part of uh, the song but also the um you know the chorus and all of that and I, I remember pulling over on the side and just you know thinking you know how different it was from my version and i had no idea if it would really go yeah that's because i don't know anything about what the how to make a hit you know <laughs> maybe that's not going to sell and they'll still have a chance i don't know what i thought but <laughs> you know but um you know, then it rose to number one, and I felt um, I was told by Gimbal and Fox, again, my managers, producers, publishers, yeah. and everything, to not talk about this song. Don't say no. a word. You know, they didn't want to lose any steam that she had with yeah. the song, and uh, they didn't want anything to sully that whole thing. But I did start to uh, get some interviewers who were interested in the genesis of the song and I did wind up talking about it and that wound up kind of pitting Roberta me and then Don McLean you know my song's better I listened to Lori's and, and on the radio it was a little bit of a competition but when I say little bit I mean a little bit because you know she was phenomenal and um that's what that particular experience was like for me where I felt suddenly like, God, maybe I should have asked for credit. Yeah. That was like, Oh, Oh, wait a minute. You know, cause it had never come up. Yeah. It had never come up. I had truly felt like I was so grateful that they signed me, that they saw something in me. Um, and then for me, it just felt like one of many things that I would just be giving away and why not? And you're good to me and I'll be good to you. And I don't know. I just didn't, um, didn't think that that was the first time that they started to claim uh, credit and be interviewed uh, that I 
started to feel funny about it. And then at the Grammys, I sat with them. And when she won, and when they won Record of the Year, uh, they stood up. And uh, I, I sat there and, and I thought that they would say something about how the song was written. But instead, they got, I just came up to the microphone and they just leaned in and just said, thank you. Thank you very much. And then off they went and pictures were taken with them and Roberta and Roberta waved to me from a distance, although she doesn't remember that. And, yeah. um, and from there, it just, um, I felt like I felt invisible. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the story of this song, it, it kind of goes on a little bit to a darker a, a, a darker thing because we wound up doing three albums four albums together yeah little by little i kind of branched off and wound up working with um henry louis who uh, was Joni mitchell's engineer and uh at one point she even came to my session which was so anxiety producing i can't even tell you like i, I couldn't that, even yeah. sing you know and my drummer john garen who was her her boyfriend asked, could my old lady come to the session? Oh, sure. And it was her. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just blew the whole session. She had her little beret and she was so, you know, yeah, amazing. And afterwards we went to a club and heard Blossom Deary. But anyway, I had wow. been a diehard fan, but little by little, I had started to pull away uh, creatively. And um, one of the things, though, was I had been so, so shy uh, on stage that from the very first second, pretty much, that suddenly Capitol was releasing this album and that meant I was going to be performing. Um, I was okay when I was singing, but when I was speaking in between songs, it was just disastrous. I would just clam up and um, had like no stage presence. And, and so they said, we got to do something about this. So they started to write my script. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's great. And I appreciated it because it gave me a tool at least, but yeah. they were older than me. And so the, the, the things that I would say would be like, um, young people today, you know, I'm 19, young people today, you know, <laughs> I reflect on the, you know, and I just, it was terrible. So one of the things that I was, that they wrote for me was, before Killing Me Softly, was uh, this is a song that uh, was written uh, when I went to see Don McLean at a concert and I felt so moved by his performance that I felt like he was singing about me and my life. I wrote a poem on a napkin, I showed it, and that's how the song came about. That is what I said, not one, two, three, not a thousand times. I can't even tell you how many times on TV shows and interviews, etc., with them nodding their heads and agreeing. But mm -hmm. as the years went by and the contracts were dissolved, and as you had mentioned, so did the personal relationship, yeah. that dissolved first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they came after me, and by that time I was 23, and they had had a huge hit with Killing Me Softly. It was just, you know, everywhere. Everyone had uh, recorded it by then. Frank Sinatra, yeah. Perry Como. Oh, yeah. You know, everyone. <laughs> and but yet they would not let me out of my contract, which had an extension for five more years. Oh, wow. At, yeah. Today that contract wouldn't have held up, but, yeah. um, and they said that I owed them. And at that time I had no money. I was living with my mom and, um, I, uh, they wanted $27,000 of my future income, which also could be $127,000, uh, preventing me from recording for five more years. So I couldn't record for five years. And um, that was a crucial time in my in my career in my life, you know, from 23 to 20, you know, seven or eight that that those days were huge. Those years were huge. And uh, I did wind up resuming my career, um, not with that same, you know, push behind me. Um, but the story of Killing Me Softly and when the Fugees came out with it in 1994, I think it was, or three, um, and uh, got a big, and had a big hit, then that's when um, they started to change their story. 
And they said, uh, the no, 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 no. Lori had nothing to do with that. We wrote the song. Uh, yeah. We showed it to Lori. She said that she identified with it, and it reminded her of the time that she went to see you know, uh, Don playing in concert, but that it's an urban myth. And poor Don even believes it. He thinks he believes this legend, but it's not true. And reclaiming that for me all these years later has been huge because, you know, people have said, Ooh, the story is very vague. You know, some people say she had something to do with it and some people say not. And so I've been kind of called a liar and it's been very, mm -hmm. very painful. Yeah. Uh, so Imagine. that's that's killing me softly. Wow. Um, well, so I know on your, like, so in the nineties, you, you stopped recording, uh, I think your last album in the seventies was, yeah. let me see, 78, yeah. right. uh, letting go. And then yeah. you resumed again in the nineties. And I want to ask you about that, but to just kind of, uh, tie a bow on killing me softly, um, your latest album, which is 2022, uh, truly you re-recorded killing me softly. Um, I, so what was that like to having gone through everything that you've gone through with the song? Like you just mentioned, Roberta Flack version, Fuji's version, the story kind of being twisted and changed. Um, and then now re-recording it, uh, with all of your, all of that story behind it and all of your other years and other albums, um, kind of within that. Yeah. You know, it's true. Um, this version is not a hit version, not going to be played on the radio. And I get that and by the way, nor do I think that, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I've continued to sing and I have a really nice fan base, et cetera. But, um, this version was a heartfelt, um, uh, very, very quiet um, version, and uh, I kind of let it all hang out in my own vulnerability. You know, I, I think about yeah. that girl. I also think about what happened to that girl. Um, yeah. And I also feel some triumph because even though it's a yeah, but story. It, it's, it could be worse. At least I not, didn't kill anybody, you know, <laughs> and known for that. Yeah. So there's that, but, um, but it, this version, um, was all of the elements that I wanted it to be. It, it created the sentiment of, and, and sadness of the song, which, I don't know if a lot of people tap into the sadness of the song. I, I, I hear, you know, whoa, you know, one time, two times, and it's fun and it's happy and everybody sings it, it's drumming my pain. It's, but that's not really what it was. It was a really yeah. sad moment, a sad song. Um, and uh, I can only say not to brag, but I will, um, that when Bob Clearmountain, who, uh, is known yeah. for, you know, the Stones and Springsteen and all of that. Uh, he was engineering. Yes. And, and that was a rare thing too. And by the way, the nicest, kindest person ever and humble. But when he yeah. heard it, he, um, a a actually was crying. Yeah. And that meant so much to me. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's something that I want to claim as I get older. I fear yeah. That's what's going to be on my epitaph. Lori Lieberman, best known and screwed by killing me. <laughs> <laughs> my two guys, you know, and I'm basically a pretty happy person. My life is good. Yeah. I had 20 albums. I've been performing yeah. and, you know, and that's cool. And I've got kids and you know, who are grown now, but you know, I, I, I don't, but the cool thing is Brandon is, I finally made peace with it. And I finally made peace with it when, when um, Alicia Keys um, was on the Grammys. And do you remember she had the two pianos and she was say, yeah. singing songs that she wished that she had written. And one of them yeah. was Killing Me Softly. And in USA Today, it said, and Alicia Keys performed Lori Lieberman's 
killing me so and I cannot tell you what that oh, yeah. meant to me. And then I know on Wikipedia things can change, but it says in collaboration with Lori, and that's all I wanted. Just yes. please give me a little, a little nod. Uh, as you had said in your you know, in your piece, which I just loved and watched a thousand times, um, you know, I, I, uh, first of all, thank you for updating my original version and putting it with the, Absolutely. the current. Yeah. That was so cool. I, you know, it, it was, uh, it meant so, it meant so much to me. Um, but when she performed it, it's true. I'm not look. I, it's been 50 years. I'm not going to. Yeah you know, go to a lawyer and, you know, I, uh, yeah. I'm not going to do that. It, it's a brain drain. I, 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 I don't want to do that. And it's sad because Norman Gimbel has passed away. Um, you know, it, uh, so he can't speak for himself. And yeah. I just want, I just want what I'm getting, which is, you know, that's, and that's really cool. You know, that yeah. uh, uh, best known for, and hopefully other things. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, with my, with my video on it, um, I wanted to showcase you by way of the thing that most people know, which is many people know, especially my audience, uh, know the Fuji's version. Um, and yeah. then thinking of that as a Roberta Fleck original, um, that's in a heavy air quotes. Um, but then yeah. not enough people know the, the actual origin of the thing. So, yeah. um, yeah. and in what I try to do with my own videos is I always try to have some sort of musical element to it. Um, yeah. and I'm a, a bass player and DJ. So those are, um, like I'm, I, you know, I can fake my way through guitar, but I'm not going to put a video of myself playing guitar or singing or anything like that. So, uh, mm -hmm. Being able to play bass with then the Roberta Flack version that, that people know and then the Fuji's version that people know and then, and then put your original vocal with it and then liven it up with some bass. Uh, it was uh, so much fun for me um, to be able to pull all of those elements together. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's so cool. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you isolated my – well, it's unbelievable. And how you also – did to my eyes and then you took a pause and you did that yeah, and it came. yeah. that was so great that was great <laughs> so <much. laughs> i thank loved you. it thank you um, so much yeah no you're amazing um and um you know but i wanted to say too that it's yes. interesting uh you know women in the business and uh you know, feeling that they don't maybe have a right to speak up and speak out. You know, yeah. the when Roberta did that song, um, you know, she is the one. Not only did she create that 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 whole thing, but she's the one that wrote. You know, or, or whoa, that was not in the original. And I yeah. talked to her manager and had the pleasure of meeting her a few years ago, um, but. I said to her manager, you know, why didn't Roberta ever ask for credit for that? I mean, people know that Lauren Hill went on to do, and uh, her manager said she, she was afraid and didn't want to make waves and didn't think that she had a voice, even her, even yeah. her, someone as strong as that. Yeah. Um, and boy, she could have, you know, really reaped in some rewards. As you know, today, yeah. if you write a minute or a one word of a song and get credit for it. Yeah, um, yeah. But that that's, you know, really amazing. And, and when I met her, by the way, uh, she's not well, and that's no secret. But when I walked in to see her, uh, she looked at me and, um, and then she took my hand and she said, uh, Lori Lieberman, it's been so long, so long. Like mm. that. Uh, and she said, I can't sing anymore. I can't. And I said, oh, that's okay. And, she looked, and then she started to get emotional. And then she went, well, look at my nails. Went, oh, they look great. <laughs> oh, she's, yeah. I wished I had known her back then, but I know she was really fierce. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm told. Um, yeah, so you uh in the I think 78 we said was your last 
album from that era. Yeah. And then um, since so 1995, am I getting this right? A Thousand Dreams, that's your kind of return yeah. to music. Um, and then since then, I mean, uh, A Thousand Dreams, 95, Home of Whispers, 96, Gone is the Girl, 98, Monterey, 2003. 2009, 2011, 2013, 2015, 2019, and then 20, 2022 with Truly. Um, and please let me know if I'm missing anything there. The Girl um, and the Cat, 2019. Okay. Oh, yes, Girl and the Cat, yes. That's, uh, is that 2019? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I mean, that's its own um, positive ending uh, for yeah. me that, yeah. you know, uh, because in the in the the piece that I did, um, and it's it's focused specifically around that song, yeah. uh, you know, it it kind of uh, your story in your part in that story ends with, um, you know, where where we've talked about, but then your whole resurgence, and it's not just, um, you know, an album or two. That was so many albums that I just named, um, mm -hmm. and you have just like kept going since then. So, uh, what made you want to return to music in the '90s, and then uh, what has kept you going? Because I'm digging through your stuff, and it's like it's an incredible body of work that you've managed to do way more than you did uh, originally with your with your early stuff. Thank you for saying that. You know, um, I credit it largely to um, my now husband, Joseph Kelly, who, by the way, um, has his own backstory. And, and at some point we're going to get like a, a necklace that says the girl that and the, the guy who, because um, he he was best known for Saturday Night Fever. And he's one of yeah. the the core actors in there, Joey, the one with the patch on his eye and the, and people still recognize him, but he was a neighbor who had my older albums and had come over one day and, uh, saw, uh, probably a poster hidden in the back room of somebody's bedroom <laughs> and, uh, and said, wow, what are you doing now? You know, you should be doing this again. And I thought, well, no, those days are over. I'm probably going to, probably going to become a homeopath or a psychopath, a homeopath or um, <laughs> maybe a music teacher. Yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I sing to kids. Um, but going back in the business was not something I ever thought was a possibility. Uh, and he said, no, no, but you know, there's a huge audiophile community that I'm a part of. He was part of a company called Cello Music and Film and Mark Levinson, who's well known. Um, yes. He and Mark are partners in that were partners in that so he, he decided that i would do a two mic live recording uh in five days um and uh that was a thousand dreams and suddenly this audiophile community embraced what i did and i found i could do what i wanted to do uh and it just gave way to this kind of creative surge and the thing about joe um who i then had to marry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I mean, you get somebody who believes in you and is cute. <laughs> you know, that's all I needed, really. So by that time, I had three kids. He had four. We merged our families together. But what I appreciate about Joe is he said, Lori, we can figure this out. We can figure it out. You know, we can get our own thing going. And, um, and he never told me what I should or shouldn't do. So if I wrote a song and played it for him, if he didn't respond really well, I knew I had to work on it more. So he was never, I always felt like, and now it's 25 years, I always felt like his hand was on my back, just kind of, you know, pushing me forward. And uh, yeah. I never thought I would play piano publicly. I never thought I'd play the guitar. I never thought I'd be able to know that I'm going to be name drop, but whatever. I'm going to be at Carnegie Hall December 10th, and I don't know what the fuck I'm going to say, and it doesn't okay. matter. I've got no script, and it's it's just being myself, fully myself, and uh, and expanding my own, um, you know, writing for strings and orchestrating and just mm. doing it for myself. It feels truer than I'd ever had, 
And I feel like the more I say, the more I want to say. So yeah. that's so cool. That's great. That's amazing to have uh, someone, like you said, his hand on your back, um, yeah. helping you through and, and uh, providing that support as opposed to what you had in your early career, which is the exact yeah. opposite and uh, a hand taking um, yeah. the other way. So that's, that's amazing. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and isn't it true that we just need, really, we just need one person in our lives to believe in us, one, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it, and then we can fly, don't you think? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you said Carnegie Hall, December 10th. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a jewel box. It's called the, the while it's, it's, it's part of Carnegie. That is this sort of smaller venue. It's my third time being at Carnegie. I did the bigger one and then the next one and now this one, and it's just going to be a very intimate. Um, I think it only seats like 400 people, but it's a beautiful, beautiful, legendary theater. And I'm just going to have um, a violinist, a cellist, an upright bassist, and me. And that's it. And it's just going to be an evening with, and it's all acoustic. There's no um, electronics or anything. And very, so very cool. I'm looking forward to it. The kind of a retrospective. Yeah. Uh, and it's an afternoon concert, too. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. But, you know, there right. are times when I'm more in my career than I am, than the not. And I don't know what it yeah. is. I think I'm not pushing it right now because I don't really know what I want to say. So mm -hmm. kind of taking a step back and waiting for something to come to me. But yeah. uh, right now I'm just enjoying my life and enjoying my dog and, uh, you know, in the cool weather in California, which is going to change. And you and I both know it. <laughs> yep, it's coming. It's coming. Nightmare, I know. But isn't it nice right now to be able to walk outside, and not smell the smoke? I know. Right? I know. Yeah. A couple of summers ago, uh, 2020 was insane. <sighs> the heat and the smoke. I it was, know. That was a wild time. But um, isn't it yeah. so stressful where you, you know, you can't sleep. You're watching the news. You're watching Twitter. You're just like, what's going to, how is this going to end? And why yes. didn't I do enough? And what about insuring my piano? Am I ever going to do that? I know. It's same <laughs> thing here. Yes. I had a bass stolen uh, in January of this year. Did you? Uh, I was traveling. I was in Hawaii. Um, no. And I was there for a gig and then I was leaving. It was very early in the morning um, and I was carrying too much stuff and I couldn't um, carry it all with me. I'm trying to get to the the pickup area. Uh, and so I kind of ended up leapfrogging and, you know, putting my stuff down, walking like oh, 15 no. and then coming back. And then it's literally 10 or 15 feet. And then within that, it's like four in the morning. And then within that uh, span, I look back again, like 10 or 15 feet and my base was gone. Oh. Uh, and that's the base that I've had for, I mean, 15 or 20 years, somewhere in there. Um, oh so God. it was, that was devastating. Uh, and then, yeah, I didn't have insurance uh, or anything like that. And so, um, yeah, my, uh, my very early videos, it's in there. So I feel like it's, it's solidified, um, as, as part of that, but, uh, yeah. yes, oh, that's insurance, so painful. did it keep you up at night? A lot of nights wondering yeah. where it is and if only, and yeah. go to a psychic. Didn't you wish you had a tracker on it? Yes. <laughs> Find my I, I prefer to think because it was in, um, Honolulu, I prefer to yeah. think that it, just going to be there somewhere um, forever and not leave the island. So anytime I go back, I'll be, <laughs> you know, yeah, within it's probably, it's probably got a pina colada and it's probably sitting on the it's beach. There, there we go. Just, you know, looking out at the ocean is probably yeah. having a good, you know, <laughs> probably better than you would have given it. Yes, I'm exactly. I'm exactly. kidding. <laughs> God, this is great. This is great. I mean, we could talk for another hour. I know. Um, we have to do coffee. Just be, just be hanging out. This has been great. Um, I know. Me too. Um, thank you so much yeah. for this. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking to me and sharing your story. Um, yeah, is there I anything that out. you want? Oh, you, go ahead. Sorry. I'm interrupting. No, I was going to spread it out. Whatever. Do I, I got nothing else. <laughs> I mean, no. Yeah. Thank you. It's been so much fun. And thank me you too. so much. Yeah. I loved it. Thank you so much. Thank I hope you. we stay in touch. 
Yes, please. please. Uh, and thank you so much for, for playing uh, and singing uh, for us as well. That's, that's amazing to be able to, to hear. I'm, I think I'm laying off. <laughs> I think that's all right. Anyway, take Perfect. good care. And thank you cool. so much.